I would like to uh, welcome everyone to the session 7D uh, called Understanding Vulnerable Citizens' Needs by Using a User-Centered uh, Design Approach. My name is uh, Pasquale Cancellara. I work for Polis Network as Project uh, Membership Services Manager. And uh, I'm here to uh, moderate the session and present you uh, um, our um, speakers that will uh, talk about this very important topic uh, that is uh, 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 how to involve citizens and citizen needs uh, in the uh, design process of, of sustainable urban mobility policies. I will start with uh, some housekeeping uh, housekeeping rules. So in this session, I guess you are all familiar now with the, the housekeeping rules, but I will uh, uh, go through them as well so that uh, everybody knows and is familiar with the platform. So basically, you can write your comments in the chat. You see different arrows um, on the right hand side. You can submit your answers in the polls sections. Uh, you can view who is attending in the people tab. You can ask questions in the moderated Q&A area. So anytime, feel free to ask your questions and then we will uh, pick them up. Try to be brief and uh, so that it's also easy for us to um, ask the question to the speaker. And you can also uh, maximize your screen by hiding the chat or tapping the full screen icon. Uh, by doing so, then you will hide uh, all this part with chat poll. So it's up to you to hide or not hiding the chat. This meeting is uh, being recorded, so recordings will be made available online after the conference. Please keep your microphone muted when not speaking, and when speaking, try to be brief and to the point. Um, after the session, uh, you can check the event chat, polls, people, and Q&A tabs. Try the networking. Uh, you can discover the other upcoming sessions. I remind you that we have the closing plenary today. Uh, this afternoon and uh, you can try also the networking function to network and to meet your peers and talk to other people in the in the conference we have uh, lots of registrants uh, people registered more than 400 people so there is lots of possibility to network in this uh, urbanism next conference and you can also send direct messages to other participants okay so i will now go immediately to the core uh, of the of this presentation uh, this is just uh, uh, of this um, of this session. Sorry, this is just uh, um, one of the topics that we'll be we will address in today's session, and it's uh, the topic of digitalization. Is it a barrier or enable to accessibility? And I wanted I put this uh, uh, this um, announce that uh, my uncle in Italy sent to me uh, very upset. Uh, a few a few months ago, it was going from uh, Padova, Padu, uh, Padua, so north of Italy near Venice, to the south of Italy. Where is he from? And um, uh, basically, he arrived at the train station in Foggia. It's a city in Puglia. So after a long trip by train, uh, after like seven hours, and then he arrived in Foggia. He had to go inland in uh, my region, Basilicata, so farther south, and from Foggia to uh, the other, to our hometown. Uh, there is either a train or a bus. In this case, there was a bus. So he was uh, wanted to be self, he wanted to be independent. He had to go there and he didn't want to call anyone and say, come to pick me up at the Foggia railway station. So he, he thought he, there would be a bus, as always. But this time, during COVID period, he basically arrived at the bus stop and there was no bus there was this uh um well sorry there was a bus but there was this uh, announcement saying that uh, he could no longer on board on the bus because nowadays uh, bus tickets are only sold online uh, so he could only buy he had to buy uh, his ticket online so basically the the the, the bus driver didn't let him uh, get in the bus so he could not reach then uh, my hometown his hometown is uh, we are from the same town and basically it was um, forced to call somebody to uh, try to pick him up so this is a, just like a, 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 an example of uh, 
an impact in this case of uh, um, a simple digital, digitalization process happened to, to, to a person who was not able to buy uh, a, a ticket in advance online. So maybe this can trigger further our, uh, um, our discussion together because we have here excellent speakers who will also talk about uh, the inclusive digital mobility solutions. So let's keep this in mind. Is a barrier or an enabler to accessibility nowadays? Let's uh, start thinking about it. So the scope of this session is not only about digitalization. Digitalization is much more. It's about how to include vulnerable to exclusion citizens in a fast changing mobility landscape, uh, particularly when um, we have more and more uh, new mobility services, when we have uh, disruptive transport solutions that are becoming the new norm. But how to include vulnerable to exclusion citizens? How do we make sure that everybody is taken into account? And how can we make sure that we all benefit from new mobility innovations? Moreover, how can a user-centered design approach can overcome these challenges? How can we make sure that uh, this is also a tool? So the, the fact of including uh, all uh, citizens in the, the dialogue can actually overcome these challenges of accessibility. And what is the role of inclusive digital mobility solutions in this respect, as, we, as I mentioned before? And finally, how can local authorities, transport operators, and service developer, developers make use of a user-centered design approach to fulfill citizens' needs? So we have uh, lots of uh, different topics that we, 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 will have, we will address with our uh, speakers today. And um, I'll go now to, uh, I will present the speakers and I will also let them introduce themselves a bit with a few words. But basically today we have, uh, uh, Christine Tovas, who is a consultant at Rupert Consult, and we'll uh, talk about uh, an uh, EU-funded project uh, inclusion that ended a few months ago, and she will uh, tell us more about principles and tools to make our transport system fairer for all of us. Uh, then we will have Oliva Garcia, Garcia Cantu, who is a Chief uh, Research and Development Officer at NOMOM, and we'll talk about the Momentum project. Um, and then we have Sam Basu, senior researcher at the VUB, uh, University, uh, Vrij Universiteit Brussels, so the Flemish University of Brussels in uh, Brussels, Belgium, to, that, to, who together with Floridia Di Ciomo, who is economist and urban analyst at Cambiamo Changing Mobility, they will tell us more about the Indimo project, who is looking at how to make digital mobility solutions more inclusive. And so Floridia will talk about uh, concretely a pilot implemented in uh, Madrid and whereas Sam will introduce us to the project. But without further delay, I will give now the floor to uh, Christine Tovas and uh, uh, the screen is yours, Christine. Okay, thanks so much, Pasquale. Let me just share my screen. Okay, and there you go, okay. So thanks again. Um, so just briefly a bit more about myself since uh, you suggested that Pasquale. Um, my name is Kristen Tovas. I've been working at Ruprecht Consult for the past seven years and I'm currently coordinating the Civitas Sunrise Project on co-creating sustainable mobility at the neighborhood level, um, which I could maybe weave into our discussion a bit later. Um, but also as Pasquale mentioned, I'll be presenting uh, the recently concluded uh, inclusion project on assessing and piloting excessive, uh, sex accessible and inclusive mobility solutions uh, in urban, peri-urban and rural areas. So just to dive right in, um, one of the key questions in the inclusion project was, how can we make truly inclusive mobility a reality? And how do we make sure that we leave no one behind? So to answer these questions, we first need to understand people's different mobility needs before we can respond to them with effective solutions. And this would be our first step. So whether we're improving existing mobility services, perhaps with digital solutions or other sorts of extensions, or if we're rolling out brand new solutions. So just to illustrate the importance of this step, 
Uh, on the left, I think we all can agree that giving everyone exactly the same tool doesn't usually benefit everyone equally. Uh, whereas on the right, different people have different needs, abilities, and resources. And if we use our resources wisely, then we can level the playing field so that everyone is included. So to translate this into a transport metaphor, on the left, we could imagine a standard public transport system built for a typical working age commuter without any disabilities. And other users' needs are not sufficiently met which prevents them from fully taking advantage of the public transport system to reach jobs, education, health services, and leisure activities. Whereas on the right, we can imagine a transport system that responds to each user's needs. For example, affordable ticketing op options, sufficient lighting and security features, or audio and tactile information, just to name a few examples. So, then the next question is, what building blocks can we use to understand and respond to all users' needs? Where is our starting point? Well, one of the legacies of the inclusion project is the report that you can access at the QR code on the left, uh, which lays out the eight principles for a fairer transport system. So this was based on an analysis of 51 case studies on good practice inclusive mobility solutions in prioritized areas. And our areas, as I mentioned, were rural or remote, peri-urban, and deprived urban areas. Um, and these were also assessed across the 12 vulnerable user groups that are identified in the project, which I'll show on the next slide. And these can kind of be conceptualized as the keys to success. They're meant to help us to better understand vulnerable users' mobility challenges and their needs and to inspire effective solutions that respond to those needs. So the four on the right that you can see are perhaps the more traditional features of an accessible transport system. Maybe they're more familiar to us. So they relate more to infrastructure, ticketing, timetables, et cetera. Um, while the four on the left focus more on the human dimension and the subjective experiences of people while using the transport system. And these are viewed as equally important because they can either inhibit or they can enable people in their mobility. But since we might not have a clearer picture of what the latter four look like in practice, I'll just briefly um, go over what these solutions might look like. So when we speak about empowering mobility solutions, they are building vulnerable users' capacities to get around confidently in their everyday lives. So this could involve, for example, a training course um, or a scheme of travel buddies who accompany people on their journeys and help them get used to the, the transport system. Um, and technology can also play a role here if it creates new degrees of freedom. Um, empathetic solutions, um, they foster awareness and they build capacities, uh, for example, through training as well um, among the transport provider and the general public, so not the users themselves who need the help, but they build the capacities for those who might be around the vulnerable users um, to respond to their needs and also increasing their readiness to help. Gender equitable mobility uh, services enable all users, regardless of their gender identity or their orientation, uh, to have access to transport services that meet their daily needs. And they focus primarily on facilitating intermodality, accessibility, and safety as a key factor. And the fourth is kind of a cross-cutting uh, theme, but safety uh, we wanted to make um, very explicit as a principle. So these are mobility services that increase the perceived and actual safety of all vulnerable users. Um, by preventing accidents, theft, violence, harassment, this type of thing. And it's really important to make a clear distinction uh, between the perceived and the actual safety, because again, we feel that this is, uh, they're equally important. Perceived safety can be just as much of a barrier for someone if they don't feel safe, even if we might think from the outside, not being part of that group, that this is an objectively safe place. If there isn't enough lighting or something or, or any number of uh, variables, then certain vulnerable users might not feel safe and therefore won't make use of the transport services that are available. So just moving on to the inclusion pilot labs, uh, we had six pilot labs that you see here on the map. 
and <clears throat> they have developed and implemented 14 different measures, each of which operationalize several of the eight principles that I mentioned, and they also benefit all 12 vulnerable user groups. So uh, we have a few of the usual um, or the more commonly understood groups here, um, such as elderly and physically or sensorially disabled, but we also focus on a number of other groups that haven't been brought into the discourse as uh, in the mainstream or have been overlooked typically, such as migrants, people with a low income, um, people in rural or remote areas, uh, youth and children, um, and also women, although we make up half of the population, still the transport system often doesn't adequately respond to the needs of women's mobility um, patterns. So for each of these <clears throat> vulnerable user categories, we can sort of qualitatively assess vulnerable users' needs and the types of solutions we should prioritize to respond to those needs. So here we have some examples uh, from three different user groups. And as you can see, the mobility barriers that they face and consequently their mobility needs are very different. But of course, many people fall into multiple categories. Uh, for example, we can definitely imagine plenty of people across Europe who fall into the categories of elderly, living in a remote or rural area and with a low income. Um, so that's why it's also essential to take into account the complexity of people's needs. So based on the lessons learned through our pilot labs, the analysis of the 50 case studies and these eight principles of vulnerable users needs, inclusion proposed the following recommendations uh, covering four main categories. So I'll just start in the upper right. And that is that we need to, of course, start with the users. So solutions that are developed by vulnerable users for vulnerable users are nearly guaranteed to respond directly to their particular needs. Uh, we also need to recognize compounded needs. So many users are associated, as I mentioned, with more than one category of vulnerable user and are consequently even more affected. So we need to take that complexity into account. And also essential um, for the success of any mobility measure really is building and maintaining trust with the users who will be, um, who it's being designed for. So by maintaining direct two-way communication with users throughout the process of developing inclusive mobility solutions, we can help to build this trust. And that can even be further strengthened through um, approaches such as co-creation, where it's very much a bottom-up development and we actually consult the users themselves as the experts on what is needed and how it should be designed. Uh, we also, at the bottom, uh, the bottom two squares there, we should initiate cross-sectoral and public-private partnerships. So the private sector has a role to play in extending the range of options, um, but they need active support in terms of direct involvement and sometimes um, public-private funding uh, from various departments within the public sector, as well as from community organizations and investors. And uh, now moving on to the top left, um, it's essential for us to identify the role and the limitations of digital solutions. And this was one of uh, the really main outcomes of the inclusion project is we focused a lot on ICT solutions um, and they can be very useful tools, but they can exclude some users. For example, if they don't have a smartphone, they have data limitations, even if they do have a smartphone, maybe limited technical skills, visual impairments or local language skills are limited etc. So um, this needs to be acknowledged from the outset and uh, a variety of solutions need to be offered as Pasquale was mentioning in his anecdote in the beginning um, so that everyone can make use of the service. And lastly, related to this, we just need to maintain the human touch. I think that's unavoidable no matter how much we're um, continuing to rely more and more on technology, apps, um, various automated uh, services, we need that human touch, and this is especially important for socially isolated groups. So by keeping these recommendations in mind uh, and the eight principles in mind, we can ensure that inclusive mobility projects work not only technically and financially, but also that they holistically address the target user's various needs and that they leave no one behind. Thank you, and feel free to scan the QR code there 
You can access all of our publications as well as a little three minute video that'll give you an overview of inclusion. Thanks. Thank you very much, Christine, for this very inspiring presentation about the inclusion project. And uh, I love your uh, uh, the, the point you made between equity and equality is so strong and so clear. So we'll, we'll definitely get back to, to this topic uh, uh, in the debate mm -hmm. because it's, it's key for, for this uh, session. In the meantime, I would like to um, ask all, uh, invite all of our audience to, repl to please reply to our poll, to our first poll. We would like to understand uh, who you are, where do you work? So there are different options. Are you a mobility planner? Are you, do you work for a city, for a region? Are you an architect? Are you an urban planner, a university, an NGO, or someone else? Let us know. Take your time to reply so that we can understand and I can uh, also then share um, the results with our speakers and they be they might be, uh, they will, uh, um, they know who are, they are talking to. So in that case, uh, they will uh, um, be much more um, prepared to answer to your questions and to address your uh, your questions. So in the meantime, uh, I don't know if Nicholas, you see, my colleague Nicholas is uh, receiving uh, answers. If yes, then uh, uh, he will show the results uh, or let me know when I can show the results. Otherwise, we go to uh, the next presentation and the next presentation is uh, uh, Oliva. Uh, that will uh, present us uh, the uh, Momentum project, uh, who is uh, uh, looking at uh, uh, modeling emerging transport solutions for urban mobility. Uh, so I will uh, uh, let her introduce, give a few words about uh, uh, yourself, present yourself, Oliva, as well, and uh, the screen is yours. Thank you, Pasquale. Okay, well, I, well, my name is Oliva and Pasquale, thank you very much for, for the invitation. I'm going to present what we have been working in Momentum, what is related with uh, inclusion. I work in Nomon. Nomon is a company based in Madrid and is working basically with the analysis of geolocated data for the reconstruction and understanding of mobility patterns also for the development of different modeling uh, tools for uh, taking aiding uh, decision makers to take decisions. So in this sense, we have joined the, the Momentum project and I'm gonna, I'm gonna present my... So we have developed different tools that help us to understand the mobility needs and the mobility patterns of the users of the new new forms of of mobility so okay i think i'm sharing if if you cannot see my my screen please please let me know so well today i'm going to talk about a technique of how to understand uh, and assess inclusion from the analysis of big data sources so well as we have mentioned it as it has been mentioned before we have seen we have witnessed the appearance of different mobility forms shared mobility mobility as a service connected autonomous vehicles so there are all these new forms of mobility that are coming out to the market uh, have appeared like in the last five years without giving us time to think much about their consequences and their impacts on the different users and on the different uh, mobility ecosystems. And they have come here with the promise of solving much of the problems of the normal common uh, mobility, urban mobility. Within them, they promise to be more sustainable, to give an answer to the different needs of, of the users, but still they are very new and still we have not much evidence of the real consequences or the real uh, impact they are having in the, in, the, in the society and in the, in the urban mobility. In general, how are they uh, interacting with public transport? Are they really being 
uh, inclusive to vulnerable groups? Are they really bringing this solution they, they promise? So, I mean, we really need to understand how these new mobility solutions are, are working such that the people in charge, the, the planners and the, and the mobility authorities can really take decisions to take advantage of these new forms of mobility, making sure that they are really uh, bringing solutions to the, to the general uh, society. So in this sense, I mean, to understand how these new forms of mobility are impacting, we have a problem is they came here, they expand everywhere, but still they are bearing much evidence of their implantation in, in the different in the different cities. And it's still, I mean, in the common mobility surveys, we don't have much information of them. Most of them that are not even taken into account uh, whenever we do the typical uh, general mobility surveys. Or if they are included, it's difficult to get really a big sample that help us to, to study them because they only represent around I mean, in, in, in cities like Madrid, 1% of, of, the, of the total mobility. So one of the questions or one of the opportunities we, we find is that with different mobility data, geolocated data, we can extract information about users and the use that is being made of these new mobility forms. How? Well, taking advantage of all the digital traces we left when we use, for instance, mobile apps or mobile or the intelligent transport cards used to, uh, to access to, to these different um, mobility services. So in this momentum uh, project is exploring how different techniques like data analysis techniques, these different transport modeling techniques uh, have been that uh, can be developed to help planners to understand the effect of these new mobility services. And within the, 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 the scope of this project, um, we apply these different solutions to four case studies for cities participating in, in the project. And one of these cities is Madrid. The concerns of the Madrid city is whether these new forms of mobility um, are uh, really inclusive to vulnerable people. And mainly they are interested in uh, people, elder people and uh, people with lower income. So Madrid works as a perfect living lab for this experiment because it holds a great variety, variety sorry, of shared mobility services. We have four car sharing operating systems, four motor sharing system, one public uh, bike sharing system, and a lot more than 15 electric scooter operators. So in this moment, the, the, the authorities, the city of Madrid is wondering whether these services are really bringing solutions to the people and, what, and whether they need or not to be regulated and how they are increasing or decreasing different gaps. In particular, as I was mentioning, we are worried about uh, elder people. We have more than 20% of the population of Madrid is above 65 years old. And also we have steep income inequality. So we really want to make sure that these new forms of mobility are inclusive to these two vulnerable groups. So in this sense, since as I was mentioning, data is very scar scarce about uh, people using these forms of mobility, we are exploring how different special analysis can bring us some light on really the characteristics of the users of these forms of mobility. So here I'm gonna present a couple of experiments we have made in the scope of the project. I mean, this, 
this analysis is, is an ongoing work, so these are preliminary results or very first results in, in line to assessing the, the characteristics of, of the users of these forms of mobility. And I'm going to concentrate on these characteristics related with inclusion. So what in this experiment I'm showing you, what we did is to identify the home location of the different um, users of the of shared mobility in, in this particular example I'm I'm showing we are focusing with BCMAP the public uh, service of bike sharing system of the of the city and then from the data of BCMAP we are identifying the location of the users and using different map matching information of the of the income of the different neighborhoods we are assigning incomes average incomes to the users of these of these users and we are doing a comparative analysis and what we can see in these graphs is the right left what we can see is that the users of the service tend to have a higher income in than the general population of the city so in here we can assess that really use kind of mobility tend to have a higher income. Now, if we do this same analysis for people living inside the geofence, inside the service area, we see that this difference is not so steep and they have more or less the same income. While if we compare the income of the people living outside the area of the service, what we can see is that uh, this is also more or less um, similar. It's a little bit higher the income of the users of Sherman, but it's not so marked the difference as with the, 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 the first experiment where we compare all the users of this service with the total population. From here, we can conclude that actually, I mean, that yes, the users of these services tend to have a higher income, but it's not clear that this higher income is because the service is not attractive for the rest of the population, that it seems to be more marked when we go outside the service area, meaning that maybe the way the service is deployed is biasing the kind of people who is having access to this service. It's, it means this, this service is deployed in the city center of Madrid, where the general average income is a bit higher than the rest of the population. And we also see that adopters of this service, only 8% of the adopters of this service live outside the service area, which means really the way the service is deployed is already filtering the people who can access to it. So an experiment we made to see whether the, the users of this service uh, are, uh, well, are filtered by different ages. What we saw, we made an experiment where we perform a correlation study between the general mobility segmented and by purpose and the mobility observed in uh, shared mobility services. And what we found is that there is a higher correlation for younger people. That means that younger people tend to be the users of these services, people between um, 40, between 20 and 45 years old tend to be uh, more users of, of these services than older people. And we also see that this mobility is more related with uh, trips related with uh, non-frequent activities like leisure activities. So in this, from here, we can conclude that this service is also filtering out people with um, 
with the high, well, older people. So these experiments uh, were, were um, performed basically to see whether simple spatial analysis can help us to understand the, the users of these shared mobility services when the data of the users is not really available, is not directly available, when we don't have specialized surveys on these kind of, of services. So this is preliminary work, but from here we can already conclude that special analysis can reveal already insights of the users of shared mobility. This is, I mean, a, a conclusion about the, the methodology. But from the conclusions of applying this methodology, we can conclude that the service deployment is influencing the characteristics of the users. We can also conclude that the users of shared mobility tend to have higher incomes. And the question is, this is related with how the system is deployed or is something that tends to be like this? Unfortunately, in this talk, I couldn't present because we, we didn't get on time the the approval from the owner of, of, of the data, but I couldn't show, we have also data from private uh, service providers for mortal sharing ser uh, services. And we see that these differences also appear outside the, the, the area of service, meaning that actually, yes, they tend to have higher incomes, even if the service is open to, to other areas. And we can also conclude that the mobility patterns of older people are less correlated with shared mobility patterns, uh, which then we observe in younger people, meaning that this service is really not attractive for older people. The reason for this may be, as Pascual, Pascual was mentioning, that to access to these services, you need to have a certain knowledge of a digital, well, you have you need to have a mobile phone, a smart mobile phone, and this has to be done through through an app. So, well, we have to do future research, and uh, we'll see. I mean, we'll keep studying if the nature of the trip susceptible to be catered by shared mobility services um, are can give us more information about the characteristics of the different population groups. So this is all I want to tell you about the experiments that have been carried out in this, within the scope of the Momentum project. And if you have curiosity about the different results and the discussion on different barriers for the adoption of the services, you can visit the, the web page of, of the project. So, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Oliva, for, very, for this very interesting uh, presentation. I understand, yes, that, that the system at the beginning has, uh, is filtering people to access transport uh, solutions and shared mobility. So there is a problem at the very top um, that uh, is uh, um, preventing people, all types of people, to uh, get the most out of these uh, new mobility uh, services and shared mobility solutions. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. We will get back to you during the panel discussion. Uh, in the meantime, I would uh, like to uh, invite uh, all uh, our audience to ask your questions in the Q&A tab. So if you go on top uh, right, you have event and session, you click on session, and then you have sub tabs, chat, polls, people, Q&A, and in the Q&A, you can ask your question to uh, to the to the speakers uh, from the previous uh, uh, poll, we understood that uh, you're equally divided into mobility planner, city regions, and uh, university. So there isn't a, there is a balance in this respect on who you are. And in the meantime, we uh, have a new poll that my colleague Nicholas has launched. I would like to know, after also this presentation from Oliva, from one, which means not inclusive to five, very inclusive, how much do you think new shared mobility services are inclusive for all citizens today? Also take into account uh, where you live or your experience and uh, your knowledge on the topic. What do you think? How much do you think nowadays 
how inclusive they are for all types of uh, users. So in the meantime, you can uh, um, reply to uh, our poll. But now I will uh, give the floor to Samoj Basu. Before I could not uh, pronounce his name correctly, and now I I learned it. So it's uh, our um, um, next speaker, who is a senior researcher at VUB, and uh, he will uh, talk about some more uh, the Indemo project in general. Uh, so uh, Sam, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you Pasquale for uh, for inviting Indimo to present our project, and uh, and also we have uh, I have today one of my colleagues from one of our pilot cities who will be presenting after me. Uh, so my name is Shamojit Boshu, and I work as a senior researcher in uh, a Free University of Brussels in the urban mobility team. Uh, in the urban mobility team, we mainly work on different urban mobility solutions in terms of policy evaluation, sustainable solutions, citizen science, uh, scenario planning, impact assessment uh, in this kind of fields. Personally, I also have a background in uh, working with different uh, road safety solutions. So in, in short, that's what uh, we do as a, as a team in the urban mobility uh, research group in the uh, mobility uh, research center of the VUB uh, University. Uh, now I'll be presenting you uh, our project in DEMO, uh, where we are working with uh, different accessible and inclusive digital mobility solutions. I think now you can see my presentation. If you cannot, please let me know. Uh, so yeah, uh, so this is our project. Uh, it's called Indimo. And Indimo stands for Inclusive Digital Mobility Solutions. Um, so uh, as I said, my name is Shamujit Boshu and I'm from VUB. Uh, so we are uh, leading this project as a project coordinator. And along with me, uh, there are also two of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Professor Imre Kesiru and Hannes Delare, who is working in this project. Uh, Indimo is a Horizon 2020 project, which enables uh, different stakeholders in the transport uh, scenario. Uh, for example, developers, uh, policymakers, service operators to to advance uh, accessible, inclusive, and user-centric digital mobility solutions. Uh, so in terms of this, these objectives, I can already uh, see a lot of synergies with uh, the projects uh, my previous speakers have already talked about. And uh, they, in fact, uh, also valid. As I go well. along the presentations, you will be able to see uh, there's a a lot of synergy and validation between across all, all three uh, of these projects. Uh, so now coming to Indimo, so our project uh, is a three-year project. Uh, it started in January 2020 and it will go until December 2022. So as you can see that we are almost at the middle of our project. Uh, so we already have some um, results to present, but we also have uh, a farther path to go in terms of uh, achieving our objective. Uh, it's a Europe, um, uh, sorry, Horizon 2020 EU project, almost uh, of uh, a 3 million euro uh, funding contribution. And uh, the coordinator is uh, Free University of Brussels, VUB. But we also have a fantastic consortium of uh, 15 partners. You can see their name here. And uh, it's a very uh, diverse consortium of uh, different universities and also research organizations at the at the same time also um, uh, regional authorities uh, so we we really have a, a diverse group um, yeah now coming to uh, the project objectives as i already said that our project objective is uh, mainly about the how to how we can make uh, our digital mobility solutions more inclusive and accessible so you can see here in terms of uh, five different points of our um, project objectives uh, the ones with green tick has been or have been already uh, achieved and uh, the orange one is now ongoing 
and race two will be achieved in in next one and a half years so uh, the first objective is to uh, was to understand uh, the user's need towards a uh, digital uh, transportation system so we we have uh, a lot of digital transport solutions around us but we feel that it's really uh, in, important to understand that what are the user needs that that's uh, pre uh, that are present towards these solutions and at the same time also we need to understand that to to use this uh, these solutions present around us what are the user requirements what are the requirements uh, uh, these uh, solutions um, uh, expect from the uh, users of these solutions so we we analyzed uh, these needs and user requirements in first uh, first year of our project and as i go along the presentation i'll, I'll present some of the results and uh, later on uh, um, one of my colleague Floridia will present uh, a particular pilot case of Madrid where uh, she will present in more detail the user needs and requirements of, which we found for that pilot. And uh, the third one which is ongoing is uh, the co-creation of the tools. Uh, what I mean by tools, I'll come uh, uh, come to that in a in a in a moment. Uh, so we are actually co-creating the tools that can help different stakeholder groups. As I already said, the stakeholders like engineers, developers, and operators, policymakers, to to generate a inclusive and accessible personal digital mobility system. So we are now co-creating the tools, which is ongoing. And uh, later on, we also want to uh, implement this and uh, influence future policies um, and help uh, different uh, stakeholders group in uh, different levels, regional and also European. And throughout our project, our idea and objective and core value is also that we foster the idea of universal design throughout uh, the co-creation process of these tools. Uh, now coming to the tools. So I was mentioning about uh, co-creation of tools. So what I mean by tools, uh, so one of the prime objectives of this Indimo is to come up with a digital mobility toolbox. Uh, so the toolbox will have four components, um, namely universal design manual, universal interface language icons, cyber security and privacy assessment guidelines and policy evaluation tools. So in short, uh, this toolbox will be um, uh, a guideline, a comprehensive guideline, starting from uh, uh, a design manual, also uh, different uh, accessible and inclusive uh, interface icons, because we are here talking about digital solutions. So uh, we, we are con constantly interacting with different icons in the digital space, but it's also important that we, um, we have uh, the system around us, which is uh, secure from the cyber perspective and also um, data protect uh, from the data protection perspective. Uh, and finally, the fourth component of the toolbox is the policy evaluation tool. This is a uh, this will be a tool for the policymakers in order to already assess even before deploying a mobility solutions how much that mobility solution is going to be accessible and inclusive in future. So uh, these are four components of our tool uh, toolbox, which we are going to develop. And this toolbox will be helpful for the stakeholder groups I already mentioned in terms of developing user-centric, accessible, and inclusive digital mobility solutions at local level, but also at, at European level. Uh, now coming to what uh, what's our concept and methodology. So I have already talked about four different um, stakeholder groups. But here we also consider citizens as one of the stakeholders of our digital mobility solutions because uh, citizens are the ultimate uh, beneficiaries of the, or the users of the digital mobility solution. So we feel that they should have a say in how these tools are developed in, uh, in the mobility system. And uh, to, to co-create the tools I already talked about, we want to foster the idea of universal design, as I was saying. So by universal design, we mean that 
uh, as you can see in the inner circle, different um, different characteristic which should be there in terms uh, in a in a digital mobility solutions. So it should require low physical effort. It should be secure, and uh, it should be also like Christine was talking about uh, equity. So it should be socially, specially, and economically equitable. Um, it should be flexible, simple, perceptible, and also there should be tolerance for errors. So this is our core methodology and concept, how we want to develop our, uh, our tools and guidelines. Uh, so in terms of uh, users, um, we are mainly focusing on vulnerable users, which is also the, the theme of this session. Uh, so in terms of vulnerable users, we are um, we have many target groups, uh, namely lower income citizens, rural residents, ethnic minorities, foreigners. Um, uh, there can be citizens with uh, a lower level of education, people with uh, low digital skills, um, non-connected people. It can be uh, due to different reasons at this moment of time. Also, it can be due to COVID, for example. And then older people, also people with reduced mobility and women. And so we feel that if we can develop a, a digital mobility solution or any mobility solution for vulnerable user groups, that will automatically be good for all users. So, so something which is good for uh, the vulnerable ones, that is, we feel that is good for all. So that's our our concept. And um, in terms of pilot projects, we have five pilots around Europe uh, where we want to test the tools uh, we are making. And it will be an iterative process. So we will test our tools, uh, see how it's uh, how how the people are interacting with it, uh, how the stakeholders are feeling about it. And iteratively, we want to also uh, improve our tools in um, in, 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 in multiple cycles. Uh, so now coming to different uh, different cities. So we have Madrid, Antwerp, Berlin, uh, Emilia Romagna in Italy, and Galilee in Israel. But these uh, pilot cities are very diverse, starting from um, a, a cycle logistic platform for deliveries in Madrid. In, um, in Antwerp, we have a smart traffic light system. In Berlin, we have a ride-sharing system. Uh, in Emilia-Romagna, we have uh, a smart locker system. And uh, in Galilee, Israel, we have an informal ride-sharing service. So as you can see, our pilot projects are quite diverse. And uh, in terms of results, what we have achieved so far, so we have identified some of the user requirements uh, in terms of uh, Having, um, in terms of having an inclusive and accessible digital mobility solutions. And uh, these are some of the prime points which I have mentioned here. Floridia uh, will talk about um, these user requirements in details for one of our pilot cases, Madrid. Uh, and we feel that uh, the technology should be accompanied by, uh, by right guidance, channel, and assistance if we want to have a uh, a successful digital mobility solutions. Uh, another point which is very important is that it's fine that everything is uh, digital and digital is also enabling a lot of people to access these services, but human contact points are really needed. And services should be aligned with user values, principles, and ideas. There should be uh, no compromise on data security and privacy and uh, there should not be an overload of information so that people find it confusing. Uh, proper coupling of digital experience and physical experience of the service is very important. So what uh, you actually can access physically that should match the experience. And at the same time, autonomy and self-confidence is also important if we want to have a successful uh, digital mobility system in a, in a city. Based on these requirements, we have developed some personas and journey maps, which uh, we will use uh, later on to develop our tools. We have also included uh, stakeholders in our analysis, and we have uh, identified some of the barriers and drivers that stakeholders feel. Uh, by stakeholders here, I mean um, policymakers, operators, 
uh, also service developers, uh, when they want to deploy an inclusive and accessible digital mobility service. So in terms of barriers, uh, generally, there is a lack of regulatory framework, trust between different public and private organizations. Uh, also, there's a lack of user involvement and co-creation processes. So there's, there's a lack of understanding in terms of knowledge about vulnerable to exclusion people groups. Uh, also, sometimes the market is unstable and uh, there's a limited willingness to share data across uh, different stakeholder groups. But there can be some, there, there are also some drivers which can drive uh, the implementation of uh, a digital mobility solution, which is accessible and inclusive. So, for example, if you have a stable market condition, comprehensive regulatory framework, and if we can integrate different mobility modes, mainly with the public transportation as a backbone, and consult different users or their representatives in terms of co-creation process. And if you can follow a, follow a bottom-up approach instead of a top-down approach, um, I, we feel that we will have a better chance and uh, it should be modular and agile, the development of such solutions. Uh, stakeholder collaboration is very important, also sharing of data. And last but not the least, there should be support uh, from the government in, in terms of subsidies and incentives. Uh, now, uh, coming to uh, the personas I was talking about, which we have developed. So we have developed personas uh, from our uh, understanding of user needs and requirements. And uh, by, by personas, we mean it's a fictitious person, uh, but it's showing the user needs and requirements, but also the user characteristic which we have for different uh, of our five pilots. So here I'm presenting one of the personas, which is there for uh, one of our pilot cases, Berlin. Uh, so here uh, she, her name is Marie, and she's a 30 year old uh, woman who is on maternity leave, and she lives uh, with two kids, one newborn in a peri-urban area of Berlin. She's open-minded and comes from a middle-income family. Uh, so uh, in terms of characteristics, she's open to new technologies, but doesn't uh, get much time to explore new things of her own. So, um, so she, um, she actually needs uh, information from others. Uh, in terms of needs, uh, she wants to connect her different appointments and locations. And it can be a visit to a doctor or a supermarket. Uh, so her uh, needs are flexible, but she needs a, a reliable and punctual service. But the public transportation is not really comfortable and available uh, in a right way in her uh, area. And also her family car is generally taken by her husband who uh, commits for uh, his work. And in terms of uh, sources of information, she generally um, expects and looks for information in different public transportation, general websites, and also social network. Uh, so as I said, uh, Berlin is, uh, our Berlin pilot is about a ride sharing service. And she uh, wants, uh, her requirements for such a service is that it should be affordable and the driver should be empathetic and helpful because she's uh, here um, looking to uh, take the ride with her newborn kids and there should be also a child seat available and she will also want to trip chain so she wants to connect different locations she wants to cover together and the pickup location should be flexible and easy because she's traveling with a child uh, we, similarly, we have different other personas. I'm not going into detail. So there's the Arabic uh, Arab women uh, for the Israel pilot named Miriam, uh, who is a village uh, village dweller and a student, but she goes to a uh, city uh, for her student job. So she is using an informal ride sharing service. Then there is Maria Carmen, who is a socially isolated older woman. Uh, living in uh, Madrid, uh, who needs uh, support in everyday expenses and also wants safe conditions. Then there is Luisa from Italy, who is an older woman living in a village, uh, and she moves around in a, in in foot or on foot or by bus. And finally, there is Johanna from Antwerp, who is blind, 
a 40 year old and active walker so she is looking for solutions to cross traffic lights uh, and we are here working with the smart traffic light solutions for the uh, for the Antwerp pilot uh, finally uh, we have a co two more minutes uh... yes uh, this is the last uh, slide uh, so finally, we have a co-creation community uh, where you can join us because we are uh, looking for to different stakeholders to co-create our solutions. Um, you can visit our website, indimoproject.eu, and uh, where you can um, we, we can co-create our tools together. And uh, there are also uh, different co-creation workshops we organize um, from time to time. Uh, so thank you for your attention and uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take it in the discussion part. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sam, for your for this uh, inspiring presentation. Very interesting to see the different vulnerable uh, citizens needs uh, in your in the personas. And uh, just very quickly, uh, if you can give us very quick reply to to, to this question, do you also include in your project people who do not want to use digital mobility services? Or do you take them into account? There are people who might don't want, more and more people who don't want really to, to use also, you know? Uh, yes, uh, yes. so uh, we, we feel that digitalization is not the final solution that uh, needs to be there uh, by hook or crook. So we are also in our project looking for solutions where we can make the same services available to the users, but through different channels. So for example, if there is a car sharing service, there should be an alternative of using the app to book the service. There can be a phone service to book the app or uh, a different channel. So I just gave one example in the discussion, I can give more examples. So indeed we are looking for alternatives to the digital channels. Perfect. So so in that case, my uncle could actually take the bus. Indeed, <laughs> your uncle could take the bus. OK, thank you very much. Um, yeah. So I will give you for now to Floridea. We'll uh, um, go in this process in link to uh, Indemo. So Floridea, you have 10 minutes for your presentation. Then we can ask you a few questions afterwards. Thanks. OK, thank you very much, Pasquale. I will uh, go with the presentation. Um, just one sec. I hope that uh, you can see um, my screen. Uh, one sec. Okay. Uh, first of all, thanks to Pasquale and Polis for uh, inviting me and Sam as well for uh, uh, giving the chance to present uh, the pilot of uh, Indimo project. I'm just the voice of a, a quite a big group of uh, um, cooperatives uh, that uh, we are and the uh, association uh, that we are uh, running the uh, pilot uh, in Madrid. So uh, I'm from Cambiamo, co-director with Gianni Rondinella of Cambiamo Centri Mobility, but the pilot of Madrid includes as well the Vivero de Iniciativa Ciudadanas uh, that are uh, our colleagues, uh, more related uh, on the participation, La Pajara, who are the, they are the operator, the delivery food cooperative and CopCycle, who are delivery food and parcels uh, platform um, at the European level. Um, so uh, actually, when I was uh, hearing uh, Pasquale about this uh, uh, situation uh, facing uh, his um, uncle was very uh, emotive for me because I'm uh, from the same region and I'm, I, was, I was thinking about uh, my father or my mother in the same situation, and this is very complex one. Um, uh, so we, what we uh, uh, try, uh, try to put in the proposal of the Indimo project, and then we are realizing uh, uh, now, after, after one year and a half, is this uh, a very strong citizen needs uh, approach that was already uh, presented by uh, Christine. And um, related to, uh, we, we really think that we cannot do an inclusive, accessible and usable services without uh, people and uh, without having their um, information and their participation. And this for that, that a strong uh, part of the story of the Indimo project is uh, um, the narrative is uh, uh, created uh, within the community of, of practices that are uh, related on in uh, all uh, pilots. 
And um, so the insights from a field work uh, gave us uh, uh, different uh, lessons learned and best practices uh, about uh, uh, the requirements identification, the journey maps definition, like uh, uh, Sam has already um, presented, in order to mitigate these uh, barriers for using digital mobility services. I mean, the, uh, the work that we do in, in the field, uh, especially with the community of practices, is uh, as a, a double uh, objective of uh, empowering people for using services and as well um, creating uh, co-creating a knowledge for uh, uh, giving to a uh, convince people like uh, graphic uh, designers UX UI designers computer programmers developers operators of mobility policy makers and other stakeholders NGO how to do the things. So this is, uh, uh, I think that it's a key point of uh, Indimo project, and uh, it, this is uh, how, why, um, how and why the, we are creating this uh, universal design manual uh, and uh, universal icons language uh, um, interface manual. Um, what we have from the background, um, the first stuff was to uh, uh, de define eliciting needs and. Uh, of course, we are in uh, transport, uh, uh, and uh, there are two key variables in transport we face uh, by the, the time that are space and time. And um, but what we uh, observe was a different way to uh, to take into account the space. Uh, Some time ago, we brought with uh, Karen Martens uh, in uh, during the equity transport action an article say maybe time uh, time saving is not anymore the most important things. And this project is uh, uh, confirming this uh, uh, hypothesis and quite uh, uh, in, uh, this hypothesis that we had because uh, time saving is important but most most uh, uh, more important is uh, caring about waiting time is crucial for use of digital mobility services especially for target groups we uh, we found that in the uh, berlin for example um, case uh, pilot where uh, mother and caregivers are uh, uh, are, are caring about the sa saving time, but not so much. They are more caring about how this time of waiting time will be. Uh, will be. And then another aspect that was already uh, mentioned by uh, Christine is that this, uh, we are uh, facing the digitalization of mobility, but what we find in the in the field is that the people needs this human contact or something that is similar to human contact, but really they need it's very stressful for them to not have the possibility to call somebody for helping them. And this is in general, but especially for um, people who have um, some uh, difficulty temporarily or uh, permanently. And if we see the, uh, the insights from the first field work, we can see that uh, the idiosyncrasies uh, of profile, and we find that older people, uh, it's a group, but it's in, sometimes it's more important where they are living. I mean, the, for example, the case of uh, uh, Pasquale, he said, okay, this is my uncle, is uh, maybe a old, uh, per, a, uh, old person, but if, even if I was there with my two uh, teenagers, daughters, I will say, face the same problem. This is a problem of a rural place. And then uh, that uh, in, uh, people are very willing to self-empowering themselves. So uh, they, they are happy to uh, learn how to use digital mobility, but uh, it seems that the developers or policymakers are doing things a little bit inside, aside and not uh, taking account their uh, feeling, their uh, needs uh, and so on. And then uh, the COVID-19 was a, a very strong um, um, life experiment for even for uh, Indimo. And uh, we observed that the digital delivery services uh, uh, as a substitute of restaurants or in quarantine, but uh, sometimes people cannot uh, use them because they are afraid about the infection. So there is different kind of result, sometimes a little bit in contradiction among them. And, um, and then, uh, once again, digital mobility is uh, as well uh, provide a gender divide. 
all personas are women. This means that uh, maybe we need to shift the paradigm how we define the uh, planning uh, and transport. And, uh, and uh, we need to, um, to, to listen to this uh, uh, demand, this request and requirements. And, uh, and then uh, we, we see, we discover that uh, disabled people as so uh, internalize the car mandate that they think that uh, it's their problem if they are slow, uh, they are going slowly crossing the street. This is something that's wrong because it's not their problem. The problem is the context that is not able to uh, include them for when they need to, um, to cross the street. And then uh, we have the target groups for uh, Madrid uh, was one of the pilots where we tested uh, more uh, characteristics of the target groups and, um, uh, and with the reduced vision, reduced mobility, social isolated, non connected, covid confinement and low income. But I would like to make a point about these target groups. Of course, target groups is very easy to understand and to see how to define the services for uh, each uh, kind of uh, um, a, a limitation, we can say, but now we are uh, experimenting in the when we are writing the universal design manual that uh, um, we need to start to think about in a gradient of uh, limitation and of capabilities, and not anymore in target groups, because this is, is a, well a way to stigmatize uh, people, and um, and this is what, of course, we need to uh, to represent uh, the capability and limitation for uh, each target groups, but uh, maybe. Or each of us has a problem at some times, and uh, uh, if we are pregnant, maybe we have a reduced mobility. I can assure you that. So it's uh, something that we need to uh, take in, into account for shifting the paradigm, as well like researcher for uh, doing that. And um, and then uh, what uh, what are the requirements that uh, were already uh, presented briefly by uh, Sam uh, in uh, the case of Madrid? We define the capabilities uh, of the people that we uh, uh, interviewed and that covered the characteristics for uh, the profile. And um, uh, there is a, a kind of level of autonomy. Um, they enjoy to store and selecting products so you know we need to think about uh, even in the digital world how to keep this uh, capability and how to keep this uh, aspiration of people um people with the reduced mobility uh, can uh, uh, purchase a large amount of, of food but uh, they need to to have uh, um, to, to to have some uh, delivery um, the limitation that non connected people, uh, actually, just to answer to the question uh, a little bit uh, of Pasquale before, sometimes this connection might be part of uh, their lifestyle. So if there are people like in, in this uh, uh, context, maybe we need to figure out a different kind of uh, digital mobility services, more analogical than uh, digital, for example. And then the limitation and uh, could be very uh, quite uh, different limitation of physical accessibility of the store, for example, or for uh, um, blind people, the limitation uh, to uh, to tend to uh, uh, avoid uh, um, uh, the, the screens, um, or uh, for uh, non-connected people, a limitation is uh, they are very concerned about data privacy and uh, security. And, um, and, and when we do a very uh, simple difference between capability and limitation, we can uh, define the requirements. So this is uh, a kind of uh, anticipation and control over graphic uh, interface, uh, human assistant that is related to human contact, direct uh, contact with the rider to arrange uh, the place uh, of uh, put the, 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 the food. And this is something that, so this is, uh, means that there is an important point about the trust between uh, people who are using digital services that, uh, and the, uh, the people who are uh, delivering the digital uh, service. In the case of Madrid, we are in the psychologistic platform for delivering food. Um, so, 
And uh, if uh, we go, yeah, this is for the other uh, profile. I leave uh, to you to uh, adjust it to, to read uh, quickly this slide uh, for uh, avoiding uh, to lose too much time. But uh, we have uh, as well as well uh, low income um, and uh, we, we, I have this limitation of all the equipment, limitation in data availability and connectivity, like uh, Christine said. I did, we defined um, just during the pandemic time this additional profile uh, related to COVID-19 confined. Uh, that uh, uh, needs to uh, help in, um, the society for avoiding the risk of uh, exposure, but they need, uh, in any case, may see the contact with the, the rider and the produce as an added exposure. So there is some uh, limitation by that. So it's very important for them uh, the, to establish a COVID protocol, even in the digital uh, mobile uh, delivery services and communicate it. And then uh, just to go to the quickly on the methodology, uh, we had a huge, uh, thanks to the pilots, the five pilots, uh, we had a huge, uh, more a uh, case study in uh, Hungary, uh, in Budapest, we had a huge work on the, on the field, even uh, uh, we were in the COVID time. Uh, a big thanks to all them. And uh, with the interview with the stakeholders and uh, the definition of persona and journey map and uh, the use of community of practices for checking our results, for fine, refining them and so on. And this is why um, we, we are, our procedure and our process were, was very user and uh, uh, non-user based. Um, and we would like to define this. Uh, um, uh, we have this methodology for uh, uh, classifying uh, the requirements and rating them and to prioritize them. So for uh, Madrid, so we have this aspect. Yes, I you need have two to more to minutes. Close. So, so. Okay, yes, okay, perfect. Okay. And um, if uh, we just uh, uh, last, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, last slide, um, we had this uh, the finding uh, that we have from uh, Madrid, the lesson learned uh, is that uh, um, mobility and physical disabilities, uh, people um, would do like to sometimes uh, be empowered to do things by, by themselves. So this is something that we need to take into, into account. Uh, pandemic and lockdowns, as both reason for increasing decre decreasing uh, food delivery. So we need to think about we uh, we have some um, current problem with the operators because uh, there there is less order now after the pandemic. Um, and then there is a key point. It's uh, not it's not a, only a provision of goods. Uh, this is uh, as well uh, a, it, it entails uh, an identity statement about personal value view lifestyle and concern. And then uh, um, just for uh, finalize, uh, I think that uh, in our project, uh, because we are doing things for user and the user, uh, a, a lemma could be nothing about us without us. So this is uh, what uh, I would like to, to say to you and uh, I stop. Thank you very much, Freddy. I could not unmute myself. Thank you very much for your very inspiring presentation. And I see that uh, the human factor here is very important uh, in, in demo, uh, in, uh, in inclusion. Um, so, you know, the fact that uh, uh, the fact that it's not only about uh, technological innovation, it's about understanding people's needs deeply, you know, going, have a paradigm change also um in, uh, in this respect and taking into account uh, these little details that they might um with, that we might not consider so in general i would like to invite now you you can all uh, share again uh, your um uh, your uh, you can come to the stage to the screen <laughs> uh, all speakers and so that we can have uh, a quick uh, discussion maybe together. We, we have 10 minutes. We close at uh, uh, one o'clock. Uh, in the meantime, I suggest also our audience to, to ask any questions they might have in the Q&A uh, box. Uh, I saw that also um, you replied to, uh, the, um, to the poll. 
about uh, how inclusive you think uh, today shared mobility services are and uh, you tend to agree that they are not really inclusive at the moment. Um, so this is uh, uh, the results of the of the poll. And um, so, yeah, to go back to, uh, so I see here like uh, Momentum, the project that Oliva presented, it's more a kind of overarching uh, policy mix uh, framework that uh, the, the project is providing by, by developing new tools uh, to analyze this big data. Uh, whereas at the same time uh, we have in demo here and inclusion that are uh, developing actually on the ground also these tools of co-creation of including and addressing uh, vulnerable citizens in the in the process of designing um, uh, policies that can take into account that they can take into account all people you know all citizens um so what I would like to understand from all of you is that, uh, so including also Oliva that uh, uh, Anna, that talked uh, before about uh, um, momentum and this uh, importance of analyze of providing a policy mix uh, in this respect. Uh, is there a unique uh, user-centered uh, design approach in this respect, or do you see that uh, um, uh, each time you have to uh, uh, like, is there a unique design approach, user centered design approach, creation approach that actually, you know, it's a ready made tool that you can apply and in that way you can actually include people? Or how does, how does, how does it, what does it take for uh, uh, local authorities and transport planners to implement and embed this knowledge that we have on, uh, you know, on, uh, on, um, on including all type of users? What does it take for local authorities to actually do this? step and to concretely include them if you would like to give a uh, each um each of you a short uh, uh statement in this respect or give us uh, your opinion i don't know if you oliva would you like to start yes yes i well i think there is not there is not a unique way how we can do it we need to understand really all the different ways to understand the needs so whenever we can, we can go to the um, affected groups, as uh, Florida was, uh, was mentioning, but sometimes there are different factors affecting. These factors are correlated and it's not always easy to understand. I mean, from the user point of view, you may see your position, you may see your needs, and what is affecting you, but there are other external factors that may be um, correlated with these with these difficulties. So I think we have to to take both views, bottom up and uh, top down. So for the top down, this is this momentum approach of understanding from big data, integrating different interacting systems from public transport a general mobility of all people, different needs to understand the different interrelations between the different groups, trying to co understand co uh, correlations between needs and how we have conflicting interests. This is from the general to the particular. And then we have, I guess, they will, of course, uh, complement on this, but the other projects that go from the specific person to the general integration with the, with the whole um, ecosystem. So I think all in all, the important thing is really understanding the needs, not only in a control way, but also with how these needs are uh, con in contraposition or uh, complement with the other needs of different groups to try to have a, an holistic view. And in this sense, I think that the tools that are being developed by the Momentum Project may help to understand this. Thank you. Would you like to, to comment on that, uh, Christine, from the Inclusion yeah. Project perspective? Also, maybe also giving an example from a pilot uh, that uh, used yeah. this approach. Yep, absolutely. So, I mean, I agree with Oliva. There is no sort of magic bullet. There's no one size fits all to make sure that we, that every transport system in every local context can serve everybody adequately. Um, but I would say from the inclusion perspective, we can at least be 
the eight principles that I mentioned as a sort of checklist, at least a starting point, um, to be sure that we look at it holistically. So no matter what group we're addressing, or if we don't know what groups we are addressing, at least um, reaching out, speaking to people, and starting with the users, as I mentioned before, as one of our recommendations. So trying to develop solutions together with the users through interviews, surveys, um, and as Olivia said, bottom up, um, but also top down um, for some of the implementation. So um, maybe just as an example, um, I know that one of our pilot labs, um, this was in Florence, they, they had a, a solution that worked with migrant groups who were living outside of the city center in Florence. And they were trying to improve the bus service for them and the accessibility of that so they could get to the city center and it would connect to a tram line. Um, that serves the area. And so what they did was they really went out there, they did surveys directly on the bus. They spoke individually with people. Um, they held focus groups. So they really tried to build this kind of one-on-one -on -one relationship and really get into the understanding of the lived experience of the people who they were working with, um, getting into all these nuances. I mean, every, every little step of how they felt, how they felt safe or maybe discriminated against, um, and, uh, and then trying to solve that issue together, um, you know, improving some training for the, the bus drivers um, and also um, adjusting the service and the location of the stops to better serve them. So that's just one example. Of course, I could mention a lot others. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. It's a very interesting example. It also gives the idea that, uh, that you actually need to take time. Like uh, if you have to go on a bus and uh, ask people to fill in a survey, it means that look, the transport authority have to plan in this, you know, think, okay, I need this time mm -hmm. to, I have to invest this part in this time to actually be able to make sure that everybody's included. But it's something that they have to take into account. I guess uh, a co-creation approach is also somehow time consuming. It's so important, but at the same time, it takes time. Absolutely. Uh, Floridia, would you like to comment on that and also? Yeah, I will uh, give less power now to the uh, top down process and more to bottom up. Um, I really think, or at least in a horizontal uh, way, uh, in the community of practices uh, we uh, put on uh, at the same level user and users, policy makers, developers, and so on, and operators. And, um, and of course, sometimes it could be uh, more difficult. Uh, it's time consuming, the co-creation time. It's energy consuming because uh, when uh, I facilitate a COP, it's, uh, I, I come out uh, very uh, tired. But it's as well uh, uh, the only way to uh, create knowledge and empower people. I just I was thinking about what Christina said. Um, okay, we do some training for drivers. But maybe we need to put the drivers with these users uh, together and uh, to see that uh, they are the same and they can share and they can find together the solution. Just uh, We are just the, just the facilitator there. And uh, yeah, this is uh, less power to experts and uh, policy makers and more power to users. So we, we are all experts, actually. Yeah, this is a problem. We, we mm -hmm. need to uh, forget about that. Sam? Yes, uh, I think uh, I, I, of course, agree with uh, all of the points, uh, most of the points uh, my other speakers have said. Uh, but I would like to take it from the poll you have launched. I think most of the people have said that uh, the current uh, shared mobility services are not so inclusive. Uh, so now coming to the coming to your question, so we have done a lot of interviews with stakeholders, so operators, developers, and policymakers. And uh, and we have seen that, yes, there is a realization also among the stakeholders that the services are not accessible and inclusive. But there are some issues why they know, but they still go don't go for it, but can't go for it in detail. Because in, in, in some cases, they don't have enough time. And also sometimes not to lose the competitive advantage or in an in a unstable market conditions, they want to go for the target groups where they can have maximum profitability. So, so I think, and also I talked about lack of trust and collaboration between different stakeholders group. 
So I think as a as a regional authority, there's a big uh, responsibility on their shoulder so that uh, they can support these uh, different stakeholder groups, be it operator, be it developer, with incentives and subsidies, and also uh, sometime mental support uh, that, yeah, we want to listen to the solutions you propose for these groups through co-creation. It, it, it doesn't matter if you have to implement it all together or separately in different stages. So our approach should be adaptive and agile um, everything uh, one size fits all solution is not there but the the stakeholders they want a general guideline and they then they can adapt solutions to each of uh, these services uh, and target groups and so we, sh we should be uh, open to listen to the solutions and adaptive in our approach i think that's the way to way to go yeah. So, for example, do you think that a, a transport authority should uh, somehow create uh, a department to that takes care that that actually focuses on this uh, co-creation approach, for example? In, on, indeed, uh, indeed, I think there should be an interpersonal department where uh, there should be uh, people who are expert in these, uh, let's say, uh, moderations and bringing people together, because uh, everybody acknowledges that yeah, there is gap. All the interviews I did, and I asked for even for their own service, do you think it's completely accessible and inclusive? They said no. So none of the stakeholders, they say that, yeah, we take care of all, and they want. But indeed, I agree with you, there should be a department in the regional authorities where they bring people together, because that's very important. Otherwise, we are thinking probably about the same solutions, but in our silos. And sometimes there's a lack of trust, and you know, also between human you you feel that uh that hesi, uh, hesitancy to approach so there should be someone or a, a department like that i i agree that will foster this approach yes any anyone else would like to to give a quick comment a final comment we have to close in uh, let's say in one minute okay uh, just uh, uh, taking into account what sam said uh, mm -hmm. i completely agree and i think that uh, what uh, um, policy makers, developers, and uh, even users, what most uh, they afraid is to have a conflict. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and this is something that in our society, we are educated to avoid, but uh, maybe we need to start to be educated to face the conflict and to go out with a better solution. I think the disruption cannot be done without conflict. And this is uh, something that we need to take into account. We have tools, we have uh, expertise for uh, dealing with that. And uh, maybe here is what, where we need to put the expertise yeah. more on, than on the providing solution. Okay, perfect. So it's not like about removing conflicts, avoiding conflicts, but about managing them. In a, in, a, in, a, in a positive way so bring new knowledge actually yeah perfect so I think it's a, it's a nice uh, takeaway Floridea and all speakers uh, thank you very much for being here I hope you also enjoyed this session thank you for to our audience and I would like to remind you that uh, we have the closing plenary at 2 o'clock uh, so we hope to see you there thank you very thank much you. and uh, have a good day